Hi, my name is William Hucker, and I am a cardiac electrophysiologist from the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm here today to talk to you about catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation. The key takeaways from this talk are to identify appropriate candidates for AFib ablation, to review the efficacy of different methods of ablation, and review why the definitions of ablation success may vary depending on the patient population. To start, I just wanted to mention the rhythm control options that are available for patients. Antiarrhythmic medications are certainly an option for patients, and those include class 1C agents called flecainide and propafenone. There's class 3 agents, sotalol, defetilide, amiodarone, dronadarone. All of these drugs can be used for rhythm control in AFib patients. However, there's significant increase in the use of non-pharmacologic methods as well, particularly for catheter ablation. I should also mention that cardioversion is also a non-pharmacologic way of controlling rhythm. And there are adjunctive therapies to improving rhythm control, including weight loss, alcohol avoidance, and sleep apnea treatment. And sometimes all of these are needed for rhythm control for a patient, or a combination of these options. So in rhythm control, one thing that may favor antiarrhythmic therapy might be advanced age of the patient, or it's their initial rhythm control strategy, or patient preference. However, favoring ablation for patients would be if the patient has had a history of heart failure, if they've had prior antiarrhythmic intolerance or inefficacy, if they have sinus bradycardia at baseline, that may preclude the use of many antiarrhythmics and limit their antiarrhythmic options, or it may be the patient preference that they want to stay off of antiarrhythmics if possible. And in conjunction with either of those methods, often addressing the adjunctive therapies such as weight loss, alcohol avoidance, and sleep apnea management will help with rhythm control. Initially, the idea of ablating AFib was thought to be impossible because if the whole atria is fibrillating, what would you ablate? But in 1998, there was a seminal paper published by Heisegger et al. in the New England Journal where they mapped where ectopy was coming from in patients' atria that triggered AFib. And they found that the vast majority of atrial ectopic beats that triggered AFib were actually located within the pulmonary veins. And this led to the idea of ablating the trigger of AFib to prevent AFib long term. That has evolved into what we do now, which is called a pulmonary vein isolation. And that has a class one indication for treating symptomatic AFib. And what's done is pictured here. And this is a picture of the left atrium from a map during an AFib ablation. And what is done is a catheter is placed in the left atrium and a circumferential lesion is placed around the pulmonary veins from the right lung and from the left lung to isolate those uh, veins and isolate any signals that are originating in those veins so that that doesn't make it to the rest of the atrium. And that can prevent AFib. This goal can be achieved in a number of ways. There are many different ways to cause tissue damage in the heart. Currently, the most common ways are either with a cryoablation or with radiofrequency ablation i.e. freezing the tissue or burning the tissue. Either way is an effective way to uh, damage the tissue at the entrance or near the entrance to the veins to isolate those veins from the rest of the atria. And ideally, this is the kind of map you would see after an ablation where purple tissue is normal and red tissue is scar. And you can see that the veins are all in red, meaning that there's no electrical activity there, whereas the purple tissue remains outside of the veins. So with doing this invasive procedure of, a, of an AFib ablation, we have to ask ourselves, how do we define the efficacy of it? The definition of efficacy really depends on why you're doing it in the first place. If the goal of the ablation is to cure AFib, quote unquote, and to, to get patients off of anticoagulation, then freedom from any atrial arrhythmia really is what you're looking for. And that idea was the driving force behind the design of many AFib trials. And therefore, most trials looked at any atrial arrhythmia recurrence over 30 seconds as an efficacy endpoint. So in this example, this was a trial called the Fire and Ice trial. And they were randomized patients to an AFib ablation either with radiofrequency energy or cryoablation. And they used 750 paroxysmal AFib patients. And they defined a clinical failure of the ablation as a recurrence of any atrial arrhythmia greater than 30 seconds or the use of antiarrhythmics down the road, or a repeat ablation. So that's a pretty high bar, I would say, to prevent any 30 seconds of an atrial arrhythmia in the three to five years following the ablation. And you can see 
that using that definition in this graph that after several years of follow-up, up to 40 to 50 percent of patients were considered a failure. However, if your efficacy endpoint is symptoms, which is the most common reason for a paroxysmal AFib patient to be referred for an ablation, you may look at symptomatic arrhythmia recurrence to uh, use that as an as a, as a efficacy endpoint. So in this trial, which was called the circa dose trial, they took about 350 paroxysmal AFib patients with implanted loop recorders, and they were randomized to different types of ablation. And by the implanted loop recorder, you could see that if you used any arrhythmia recurrence as a uh, efficacy endpoint, then about 40% of patients had a, had a arrhythmia recurrence after a year. However, if you went by symptoms, which is what these patients had from their paroxysmal AFib, then about 80% of patients were free of, the, of symptoms after a year. In a different patient population, such as heart failure patients, the definition of efficacy may be AFib burden or even mortality. In the Castle AF study, which was published in 2018, they took 360 patients with heart failure and a low ejection fraction, less than 35%, and they had an ICD present. And in those patients that were randomized to ablation versus medical management, the patients that had an ablation had reduced heart failure hospitalizations, reduced mortality, and an increase in ejection fraction by 8% after five years. So that would argue that in that population, you may not be trying to prevent any arrhythmia recurrence, and you may not be trying to prevent just symptoms, but you're actually just trying to use AFib ablation as a management tool for their heart failure. It's also important to know that recent data has suggested that major adverse cardiac events may be reduced by AFib ablation. In a large-scale study called the Cabana study, which was 2,200 patients with symptomatic AFib, and these were just patients with symptomatic AFib but not necessarily with heart failure, they were randomized to either ablation or medical therapy, which could include rate or rhythm control for patients. And they looked at heart outcomes such as death, stroke, bleeding, cardiac arrest, after ablation. And this study had a number of methodologic issues, mostly due to crossover. However, if you look at just the patients that were actually ablated, those patients, if they were ablated within six months of entering the trial or within 12 months of entering the trial, they had overall better outcomes with a p-value around 0.05. I also think it's important to mention that anticoagulation is typically continued after an AFib ablation. This is a common question about whether or not patients can come off of their anticoagulation after an ablation. And I think all of these trials show that AF recurrence after an ablation is common. And AF ablation is not typically thought to be curative. So anticoagulation is still recommended after an ablation in most cases. So in conclusion, AF ablation has a class one indication for AFib management. Pulmonary vein isolation is the cornerstone of AFib ablation. Defining the success of AFib ablation really depends on the patient population and what you were trying to accomplish with the ablation in the first place. And while AFib ablation should not be considered curative, it seems that major adverse cardiac events may be reduced long-term in patients that had AFib ablations. Thank you for your time and your attention. I hope you found this video educational.